All right, so uh, welcome participants. Uh, my name is Dan Richard, and uh, I am here, I'm Director of the Office of Faculty Enhancement. I'm here with Krista Paulson, who's the Chair of the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Social Work, and she's also the uh, incoming Associate Dean in the College of Arts and Science. So welcome, Krista. Thanks, good afternoon, yeah. everyone. Yeah, uh, so we're so glad you're, you've joined us. Uh, uh, as we uh, Again, let me give you a just brief overview of the things that we're going to be addressing. We'll start off with a brief introduction on just the, the notion, assessing uh, teaching effectiveness in different ways other than the ISQ. We'll also deal with uh, some alternative ways and uh, ways that you might consider. And uh, Krista will be sharing some of her perspectives as chair and also providing some examples and things that she's seen um, uh, in her work as, as chair. So uh, let's get started. Um, look, first of all, let's talk a bit about some motivation for why you would want to consider some alternative ways of gathering evidence of your teaching effectiveness. And of course, uh, annual evaluation is a terrific motivator. We are uh, required as to reflect on our work and to pro provide some evidence. And in the bargaining agreement, it says that in the annual evaluation that you submit to your chair, um, that if you provide evidence, further evidence beyond uh, the ISQ data, that the chair is required to um, review that and consider that in their evaluation. So in some ways, it's quite an advantage for faculty who are submitting their annual evaluations to have additional evidence of their teaching excellence um, to be provided in that, uh, in that annual evaluation because their chair has to consider it. Um, then, of course, uh, in promotion and tenure guidelines, uh, there are these statements about uh, excellence and outstanding teaching. And in those statements, it includes things other than um, your ISQ scores. So we have, uh, in terms of annual evaluation, promotion, tenure, we have these incentives and these ways that we can have our voice heard about our teaching in ways that go beyond just student satisfaction ratings. And of course, um, in any kind of uh, continuous improvement effort as a faculty member, as you're trying to improve your own teaching, um, you can benefit from finding additional ways to get at those elements and those key points of what you're trying to improve. And it can be very specific. The ISQ items may be too general to really guide that continuous improvement effort. And some uh, research by Ruben and Rosenthal suggests that when you um, have that evidence of uh, your teaching effectiveness and you pair that with consultation, either with your chair or with maybe someone from the Office of Faculty Enhancement, um, that it actually does uh, improve uh, ratings and improve teaching over time. So that's something to think about in your own practice, um, is how do you get that uh, consultation around your continu own continuous improvement efforts. And of course, um, you get hired on at the university probably because you're curious about the world, then that you have your own uh, uh, ways of engaging in scholarship, and so you probably have your own natural curiosity about, you know, is this working? Am I being as effective as I'd like to be in terms of my teaching? And so uh, these additional ways of gathering evidence might be helpful in that regard. Uh, and of course, your program, your department may have some, some initiatives that you're trying to improve uh, and that and additional ways of assessing your work uh, can be helpful in that regard as well. So lots of different ways that we can be motivated to gather uh, some additional evidence. And so now let's think about some different ways to conceptualize uh, that evidence. What are we talking about when we say evidence beyond the ISQ? Well, of course, the ISQ stands for Instructional Satisfaction Questionnaire. It's completed by students. So the students tell us whether or not they're satisfied with uh, the instruction that's provided. But of course, uh, that usually uh, might refer to any number of aspects of your teaching, and you may be more interested in particular aspects of your teaching practice. And so one way to think about this is to see that um, we can evaluate the extent to which the content that we provide is relevant, that it's meaningful, that it's helpful to students. 
We can also look at the process that we go through in our teaching. What sorts of strategies are we using? So we can collect data around that. And um, also in terms of outcomes, are the students learning the specific things that we hoped that they would learn? Then of course, we could say grades are a reflection of that teaching process, but uh, grades are really intended to give students feedback on their progress toward their degree. And they don't work so well in terms of informing faculty members about um, whether you've achieved the outcomes that you had, both in terms of, especially in terms of content and process, um, maybe a little bit in terms of outcomes, but uh, sometimes they kind of fall short. They're just not specific enough to help us in terms of uh, continuous improvement or in many cases in terms of evaluation. So um, what are the different kinds of evidence that we can collect? How can we conceptualize them? One way to think about it is in terms of direct and indirect evidence. So our instructional satisfaction questionnaires are um, a, a way of getting some indirect evidence of what students have learned. They tell us their, about their experience. They tell us whether or not they think you're um, a good teacher. Um, and if they felt like they learned something. And these indirect forms of evidence can be helpful uh, for getting that student experience. Uh, but um, what is also helpful are some direct measures of uh, what students have learned. So uh, in this case, the students aren't telling us what they've learned, but you as a competent professional or you maybe someone else uh, might look at the work, the quality of the work that the students are presenting or some other artifacts and evaluate um, to what extent is this quality work, to what extent have you achieved those outcomes that um, you're hoping for. And of course, one way to do that is to use rubrics as a more formalized and structured way of getting at that direct evidence. So the way this works is you take the student work and regardless of the grade that the student has received on the work, um, there are certain qualities that you can include in an evaluation rubric. And uh, based on how well the student work reflects those qualities, determine whether or not you've been successful in helping the students achieve. And uh, these rubric ratings can also be looked at over time. Uh, so maybe at the you know the student work at the beginning of the semester compared to student work at the end of the semester. So these are just some some different ways of gathering uh, direct evidence. You can also consider classroom observation. Of course, the Office of Faculty Enhancement provides uh, some support that way. But you can also ask your chair. In fact, many chairs. Um, do an annual uh, classroom observation for their faculty. And, um, or you can invite your chair to come and do an evaluation or a respected colleague, uh, some either in your department or someone outside of your department who is familiar with teaching and can give you some feedback um, on your own teaching. And another way to conceptualize this is thinking both about quantitative measures of your teaching. So uh, rubric ratings, for example, might be evaluated on some numerical scale. Um, or you might look at frequency if we talk about process, you know, the frequency of the uh, use of case studies or examples that you're using in your classes and how that might change over time or over semesters. So you can, you know, look at some of those quantitative uh, measures, but there are also plenty of qualitative approaches that can be used in evaluating your teaching that can be really meaningful and helpful and get at the depth of the strategies that you've used or the outcomes that have happened in terms of student learning. Uh, so this could be an evaluation of the student reflection papers at the end of the semester, for example, uh, as well. So uh, when we say evidence, we don't just mean numbers, uh, we mean that there's some kind of um, either direct or indirect evidence that we can look at and evaluate and determine the effectiveness of teaching. So this gives you a sense of some different ways to conceive of uh, evidence. And so we will kind of take some time for questions now. So if you have some questions, please uh, go ahead and post those in the chat feature. We've given you some uh, sample questions that we think might be helpful here that for you to think about and maybe uh, elaborate on. Oh, okay. sorry, no questions yet. That's the message that <laughs> All, right. Getting. All right, well, um, maybe we can talk a little bit about um, maybe some of the ways that we've seen uh, direct evidence in annual evaluations. So, you know, for example, um, I've looked at um, 
uh, my students, uh, how the, they perform in terms of their writing assignments. And so I've used a rubric for those writing assignments, um, evaluating different qualities of the writing um, as we go during the semester, so over multiple writing assignments, to see the students improving in their writing. And so I can also uh, give evidence from the feedback that I've given to students uh, to see how that might work as well, to, that, that it corresponds um, with that. So we do have a, a question from one of our participants. Um, it says, how would you get an outside evaluation of an online course? Oh, that's a good question. So um, in online uh, courses, oh, thanks, Debbie, uh, for that question. Uh, so in an online course, um, what you have is a lot more of the process that can be seen in an online course. Um, the outcomes of that online course, of course, can be demonstrated in the student work. So if students are submitting things online, those materials can be collected and evaluated um, using some kind of rubric. So to kind of speak to the outcomes. But um, in an online course, there is a lot of evidence of process. The techniques that the instructor uses um, can be uh, evaluated, can be evident in the way you structure the course, the types of assignments and activities uh, that you provided. And also, the center I know the Center for Instruction and Research Technology uh, provide a uh, evaluation tool and can do a consultation and evaluation for anyone who does uh, distance learning or, or in online courses. Also, as a department chair, at an annual evaluation time, I have had some of our faculty make me a member of their online courses so that I can go in and look at it, um, essentially from a student's perspective, to be able to see what the different modules contain, what are the elements provided to facilitate student learning, and so on. And that's been very helpful. Mm -hmm. So, Chris, maybe you can also talk about some uh, differences in terms of the things you've seen in terms of the process sure. of teaching as compared to kind of student outcomes, like what kinds of things of faculty um, provide to you in terms about their process of teaching as opposed to student outcomes. Um, do you want to go ahead and just get to that part yeah, of the sure. presentation? Yeah. Okay. Um, and that might help to generate some further questions as well. So I was really excited when Dan asked me to be part of this uh, event because several years ago, our faculty really committed to talking about the outcomes of our teaching as well as the inputs of our teaching in processes like annual evaluation and promotion and tenure. And we did a very nice faculty workshop four or five years ago about that um, during the summer that provided some useful resources to faculty to give them uh, some vocabulary to use to talk about their teaching and some suggestions about ways that they might discuss um, what students are getting out of their courses as well as what the faculty are doing. So I wanted to start with contrasting some of the ways that um, I typically have seen or used to see faculty talk about their teaching with what um, is a little bit more helpful. So in the narratives that are part of our annual self-evaluations and also part of our promotion and tenure materials that we create, faculty are asked to reflect on their teaching either throughout the year or throughout their promotion or promotion and tenure period. And often those narratives are very first person very centered on what the faculty member has done, really about what we might think of as the inputs in their teaching as opposed to the outcomes of their teaching. So lots of I statements, I included these readings, I changed the structure of my lectures and so on. And while those things are very important, and they give some insight into the faculty member's level of engagement with his or her instruction, they are fairly limited in providing evidence for the effectiveness of those kinds of efforts. So really they are a, a catalog of what the instructor has been doing as opposed to a discussion of the impact of those types of efforts. So one suggestion that I've given to some faculty as a relatively easy way of, of turning that around and making it more outcome centered is to change the focus instead of from the faculty members experience to the students experience. So what are the students doing in your courses? What are they accomplishing? Where are they falling short? 
So for instance, you might discuss how you understand students' successes and failures. So if students are grasping a particular concept very well or mastering a particular skill, can you identify what may have been happening in the class that you have been doing? Um, so you are gonna be talking about what you've been doing, but in the interest of better understanding how students are learning and therefore really getting at that notion of teaching effectiveness as opposed to just teaching activities. So again, if the students are very successful with something, is it that you spent an entire day on an in-class activity to cultivate that skill? Or is it something that you reiterated across all 15 weeks of the semester, for instance? So think about how specific teaching techniques and activities might have figured in students' successes or lack of success. It's always important to talk about those things too. Um, and also in instances where students aren't being successful in learning what you're expecting them to learn, try to consider um, not only what you might do to address those issues, but also how you are going to know if the things that you are doing to address those issues are actually working. Right? So if students just don't get a particular kind of concept, um, you probably want to do something about that, but how will you know if what you've done really made a difference? So for instance, sometimes when students don't get something, we try you know, five different things to try to fix it, but that makes it really difficult for us to know which of those five things really work. So maybe you want to do something in the first few weeks, and then if that doesn't work, think about doing something else and so on. But thinking about the students' um, experience of the course, also thinking about students' uh, learning will really reorient your narratives um, toward effectiveness and away from just that kind of input type of language. It's important to realize that um, what I'm suggesting is not that you write twice as much. And sometimes when faculty members hear about the need to also talk about student outcomes or student learning in their discussions of their teaching and they think oh well, what are you know so i write this and now i write this other thing and what i would suggest is that you just skip the first discussion of the i did this i did that and so on and try first um, a version that's from the student's perspective and really talking about their experience in doing so, you will, of course, talk about things that you did in your instruction, um, and probably you won't generate anything that's much lengthier than what you would have created um, uh, through that firsthand type of account. And you know, as a department chair and as someone who served on promotion and tenure committees and so on, I think it's really important that we all keep in mind that we want a happy reader. And a happy reader is often a reader who's presented with something that's concise and to the point. And so there's no need to go on and on to create a point. If you make it concise, concisely, and if you support your point with evidence, um, you don't need to go on at great length. You can spend your time doing something else instead. So with that said, let's talk a little bit about um, kinds of evidence um, that are more and less helpful. And again, this is just based on my experience. And for those of you who have used other kinds of evidence, we'd really love to hear about those or questions that you have about um, what we're discussing. So I've divided things here into what is more helpful um, or less helpful in terms of providing evidence for teaching effectiveness. So on the more helpful side, select examples of things like lecture slides or assessments or homework assignments are incredibly useful and really necessary to make the point um, about your uh, teaching effectiveness. What's much less helpful is what I've seen sometimes where faculty provide absolutely everything that they have done in the course of a semester. So not just a single set of lecture slides, but every lecture that they gave in every course through the semester, which really makes it difficult um, for a person to know what they're looking for and what they should be looking at. Similarly, providing every single quiz when the same quiz format is used weekly throughout the course of a semester. So be selective, but don't forget to provide evidence. Similarly, if in your narrative you're mentioning particular things that you do 
provide an example of those things. So for instance, if you're saying, well, I restructured my lectures so that I provide explicit time for some recap of the prior lesson at the beginning and a little bit of recap at the end as well, provide a set of lecture slides or lecture notes that allows your evaluator to be able to see what it is that you're talking about. Um, without that, we really have to, to take your word for it, which I'm sure is good, but it's just not quite as effective. So really, every narrative mention of a particular technique or a particular assignment should be accompanied by an exhibit, and every exhibit that you provide should be accompanied by a narrative mention. There's no need to provide evidence of things that you haven't talked about. Um, so it's really, in some ways, just like writing an empirical article. The evidence that you provide, the data that you provide, is going to be interpreted, and the interpretation is going to be supported by evidence. You can't simply provide the evidence with no analysis. That invites your evaluator to come up with a different analysis than you might want them to. <laughs> um, and you can't simply provide the analysis without evidence because intellectuals are skeptical by nature. So um, finally, it can be really effective to provide notes on the exhibits that you're creating um, or including. So again, if you're uh, including a set of PowerPoint slides that you've used in a lecture to to mark on those, for instance, using Adobe uh, Acrobat or something like that, so that you call the evaluator's attention to the things that you think are important and you make sure that they don't walk away without recognizing that. Uh, less helpful is that you provide the materials, but you don't guide your evaluator to recognize those things that you thought were most important and that motivated you for including the material in the first place. So we're just reviewing a question here. The question is, can you provide one or two specific examples on focusing students' experience learning instead of faculty perspectives and saying, I did this? So something that I would put in that category is instead of saying, um, I restructured my lectures um, in this particular way to say, students review on the last days, uh, the last lessons material at the beginning of each class. And here's how I know that that matters, um, because then they do particularly well on those quizzes that um, cover the material that was reviewed. So the amount of content is really the same, but you're talking about um, the student's experience of it as opposed to the faculty member's experience of it. Or similarly, instead of saying, um, I require students to complete reading quizzes um, every single week before they come to class on Monday uh, to say students complete reading quizzes. Um, this helps them keep motivated, and I know this because they've mentioned this to me in, in comments and so on. So you're really closing the circle in terms of talking about what the students are doing and also how you know that it matters. Again, I don't know if you have some, some Yeah, yeah, I'd, on I'd that. given the example earlier about, um, you know, using rubrics to evaluate student writing and looking at the different dimensions uh, of success on their, in their writing assignments. And so from a, uh, a focus, you know, I did this type of perspective, uh, one could say, well, I structured the writing assignments to focus on these particular elements of the writing style or the writing success and give you know detailed account of how I structured that writing assignment. Here's, here's my assignment and here's how I structured it. Um, that's kind of talking about what I did as an instructor and the, the process that I went through. But alternatively, I could look at that and say, um, well, the students were required to do these kinds of assignments and here's the outcome of what the students learned from that kind of structure. So it's really pulling in the experience of the student as well as the outcome um, of the student. Right. I hope that helped. If there are other questions, please go ahead and uh, post those. We'll go ahead and, and proceed here. So um, a final discussion of some different examples of evidence of teaching effectiveness 
that you might want to include in something like a, a portfolio that accompanies your annual self-evaluation or to include in a promotion and tenure dossier or something similar to that. I think it's very um, easy for, you know, to hear a conversation like this and, and to worry that, oh no, that, you know, I, it's too late. I, you know, I should have been doing some things um, at the beginning of the semester or all through my teaching to help set me up um, to have something to say about what students are learning in my classes or to be prepared to have some evidence of teaching effectiveness instead of just um, writing this first person reflection on my teaching. And that's sort of true, but it's also sort of not true. There are certainly some things that you can do that require more time and planning. Um, so just quickly, some of us sometimes think that the um, sort of the gold standard in terms of documenting teaching effectiveness is a pre and post test of students' knowledge or skills. And so you would give some sort of assessment at the beginning of the semester and then give the same or similar assessment at the end of the semester and be able to document students' progress in terms of what they've learned um, in terms of content or the skills that they have mastered. But of course, you have to be ready before the semester begins if you're going to do that. Um, another thing that takes a little bit more time is to, um, I know that in a lot of classes that require something like a major research assignment, faculty have students complete these in iterative steps. So for instance, a student might first craft a research question and get some feedback on that, then complete a literature review and get some feedback on that, then do a first draft of a, a data analysis section and get some feedback and so on. And that's a wonderful way to structure an assignment and it also means there are many opportunities for the student and faculty member to be interacting and for the student to be getting some coaching and direction throughout the term. However, if you're getting paper assignments and marking on those paper assignments and then handing them back to the students, it also means at the end of the semester, you have very little evidence of that coaching and feedback that you've been providing all through the semester that's been taking so much of your time. So if you know at the beginning of the term that you wanna be able to provide this evidence of teaching effectiveness, you can be scanning some of those documents before you give them back to students. So, and and not every single assignment, but an example of a very good one, an example of a student who is struggling um, and so on, so that you have those to be able to point to the kind of feedback that students have been getting from you throughout the course of the term. Third thing that takes a little bit of planning is course specific evaluation instruments. As Dan mentioned, the um, ISQ is very general and it really doesn't ask questions that allow a faculty member to drill dr down into the specifics of what he or she is doing in a given class. Um, it doesn't speak to the way that the skills and content learned in a course help prepare students for a particular profession or help them to master the um, nuances of their particular discipline. So many faculty members design um, instruments that are specialized to their courses. Sometimes they'll administer these in the middle of a semester so that they can gather any data that's needed to do some redirecting if, if need be. Some people, uh, use these at the end of a course similar to an ISQ. And again, those can be very helpful, but if you're thinking now about your 2015-16 teaching and you didn't do that, um, can't go back and do it now. But those are some things to think about moving forward. The good news is there are also a lot of things that don't take much time or planning that you can probably do now to help bolster your case for being an effective instructor. So for instance, even if you didn't do a pretest at the beginning of the semester, um, providing a, um, examples of the major exams or assignments that students completed in your course and also a discussion of how they succeeded or didn't succeed in those, you know, as Dan was talking about with the rubrics and so on, um, that can be incredibly helpful. So being able to say, my students by the end averaged X score on this final exam, which indicates that the, they know these content areas and these skills, that is evidence of teaching effectiveness. Um, marked up versions of final papers. 
sometimes you'll have those around your office because the students never came to collect them. So it can be really handy to, again, go through and find some exemplary assignments that show the level of quality of work that students are doing in your courses. If you've marked on those, you can also um, provide some insight into, again, the kinds of conversations that you're having with students. So even on a final paper, you might make a comment like, you've come so far in terms of your ability to structure clear paragraphs, or um, I'm so glad to see that you were able to refine your research question in a way that was effective. Those types of things can be very helpful and very powerful. Um, finally, just some discussion of students' successes and failures as opposed to the faculty members' perceived successes and failures can be very useful as well. So. Um, a few sentences even reflecting on things that students really mastered over the course of a semester versus things that just didn't go so well. <laughs> um, and again, what you're going to be doing about that. So we have another question here. It says, is it helpful to get a testimonial from students that have graduated from your program to attest to how vital your class was with the skills they needed when they started working? Uh, that is a really wonderful question. Yeah, um, I think this kind of you know student testimonial, and I'll include in that um, uh, narrative or discursive comments that students have provided, both as part of the ISQ or as part of some other course-specific evaluation instrument that a faculty member might use that using student comments can be very effective, especially when those comments relate back to the instructor's intentions, goals, and strategies that they've used as part of the course. Um, so let's say, for example, one of the things that you um, try to do in your course is encourage a certain level of critical thinking that you feel will be very helpful for students when they get out into the workforce. Then if you have a student who explains where their comments are targeted, toward those particular strategies that you've built into your course, it can be quite helpful to understand that the things that you're doing in the classroom and that you're having students uh, participate in as part of the course are having this kind of impact uh, long term. However, what's less helpful is a listing of student comments that have no structure around them, that have no uh, context around them, that aren't pointing to anything in particular, but are just kind of general comments that are say that you're a wonderful teacher and that everything's great. Um, those kinds of uh, statements, if they're not um, targeted and directed, can be less helpful, I, I feel like. Right. Yeah. What I would add to that, I mean, that, that's a really great question, and it points to one of the shortcomings of the ISQ, which, of course, these are administered like in weeks 12, 13, 14 of the semester when students are often at their very most miserable in terms of being uh, uh, having a lot of work, um, really feeling the crunch of the end of the semester. And it's often after the semester has ended or after they've graduated that they understand why we put them through that experience at the end of the term. And, and I think it's incredibly gratifying when we get these, these comments that say, you know, I never understood why we were spending so much time on X, uh, but now that I'm out in the world, world of work, I do understand that. Mm -hmm. And that's an incredibly helpful kind of feedback to share with whoever is charged with evaluating your teaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this kind of relates to another question about um, sharing information about students who failed, right? And um, and the uh, professor's course of action to assist students in uh, to overcome that particular uh, failure. Yeah, again, I think those uh, types of um, you know, student comments, uh, discursive kinds of responses, letters, emails um, can be helpful, especially when they're framed. So, um, you know, if if um, uh, it's it's you know it's one thing to kind of talk about students' experiences, uh, including success and failure uh, around the course that you teach or maybe a set of courses, but um, when you can frame those and say, here's how or why what I do is really helpful to students, that really has an impact on students, uh, when those comments can be connected to that perspective, 
um, I think is really great. And that um, people who are trained in qualitative methods are really great at getting to those themes and those perspectives on like, how does all of this evidence come together to tell a story about what's really meaningful, what's really impactful about my teaching. Um, those in quantitative areas maybe have a little less uh, training in that they're more accustomed to looking at patterns of evidence within uh, you know, numerical res uh, responses. So um, uh, it could, can be helpful if you're wanting to take student responses and craft some sort of narrative around what does all of this mean in terms of your effectiveness as a teaching, uh, teacher or an instructor. If you don't have training in those areas of qualitative research, it might be helpful to get someone who does have that kind of training to take a look at your narrative and give you some feedback on how you structured it, how you framed it. And in the same way, if you don't have a lot of experience with quantitative methodology, if you're wanting to use some quantitative measures and methods in terms of evaluating your teaching, is to reach out to someone who has that kind of experience and to have them look at how you've framed how you've crafted your arguments in term, and, and using that kind of evidence. So, you know, getting some advice, I think, both for annual evaluations, but especially for promotion and tenure, I think, can be, um, can be quite helpful. So we've got a couple of questions here that ask about um, conveying, somehow conveying the, either the process or the content of conversations with students who are struggling. Um, or the guidance that faculty are providing to students as they do their work. So one was about um, including email exchanges between faculty and students that helps to provide some guidance to them. I think that can be very effective. Um, then it's almost as if whoever is evaluating your teaching um, gets to be a fly on the wall during office hours. Um, and really hear the way that you're um, directing and coaching students. Also, the kinds of questions or hang-ups that students have can be very informative as well. Also, the question about, um, is it worthwhile to share about a student who fails the course and the professor's course of action to assist the student? Um, yeah, absolutely, to talk about Perhaps not an individual student, but talking about how and why students fail, I think, is important. Um, if all someone sees is that a certain number of students failed your course and there's no discussion of how and why those students failed, then the evaluator comes up with his or her own explanation, you know, which may be generous or it may not be generous to the faculty member. And so if you um, assert an explanation for what exactly was going on. So for instance, um, are some students not coming with adequate levels of preparation and you may have tried to overcome that, but it wasn't possible. Or are some students having some personal issues that are making it difficult for them to fully focus and engage in a course? or perhaps you've got a class of students at really varying levels of, of performance, or whatever it might be, providing some interpretation um, forestalls that possibility of, of someone else just saying, oh, well, so many students failed, either this uh, faculty member isn't trying to help them, or they, they just don't care, or um, maybe they have an inappropriate set of expectations. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. You know, we it's uh, somewhat easy for us to talk about student success or failure, and it's more difficult to talk about our own success and failure in the classroom. And some of the, I think, um, important and powerful explanations of teaching and demonstration of teaching excellence um, are, have come in my office from faculty members who have uh, struggled, who have challenges in terms of their teaching and they're able to explain what those are and explain what they did to overcome them and the ultimate impact on the student and so I think you know um, uh, as faculty members to maybe be a little more open about our own limitations a little bit open about our own um, challenges and 
but be able to construct a narrative that says, this is how I've overcome those. Mm -hmm. This is how I've been able to address those in terms of my teaching. Uh, when we think about annual evaluation and promotion and tenure, we think that we need to tell a rosy story where, you know, all the students are above average and, uh, <laughs> and you know, everyone succeeds, but it's not always that way. I mean, um, and I, I think uh, being reflective about one's teaching which is a mark of excellence in terms of, of being a good teacher, uh, involves considering how we haven't done so well and how we've overcome some challenges that, that we faced. Right, and it's certainly better to be proactive about that than to just hope no one notices. Right, <laughs> evaluators <laughs> are really keen about, uh, especially in the promotion and tenure process, but I'm sure in terms of as chairs evaluate, uh, and do annual evaluations. Evaluators are very keen when people are ignoring things that are just screaming out from, from the evidence and to just dismiss them and say, well, it's not important because I want to talk about all the things that I do well, right. um, is probably showing, it's communicating to the evaluator that you're not reflective and you're not honest about your teaching and that can be a problem. And you don't, you don't want to communicate that. You want to recognize, hey, this is what's going on and here's, how I, here's what I've done to kind of address those issues. Yeah, there's a question about whether these uh, slides will be available. Uh, yes, in fact, this session is uh, is being recorded, and so you'll have a chance to go back, watch, pause, um, you know, go rewind, and 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 think about some more things. And of course, if if uh, any of you are interested in thinking more carefully about these issues, uh, the Office of Faculty Enhancement is here to support you, and we can work individually with you to kind of develop some of these measures if you like. So we've uh, posted some kind of additional thought-provoking questions. This might get you thinking um, about some additional questions. Uh, I wanted to go back, uh, Krista, I wanted to go back uh, um, on this idea of using exams mm -hmm. um, and the scores on exams. Uh, one example that I've seen, uh, that I've used, in fact, in terms of talking about my own teaching, is um, to look at the, not just give scores on the exams themselves, but to break the questions down into different categories and to see how students succeeded on some topics or in some types of questions as a, compared to others. So for example, um, I uh, gave a final exam where uh, the questions had different formats. Some were just basic information type questions like about the content and other questions were about, um, uh, other questions required them to apply what they've learned and other questions um, required them to integrate ideas from multiple perspectives. And uh, so I was able to break those questions down and look at student performance on those different types of questions. It was very informative about uh, students seemed to do well on the information questions. They did surprisingly well on the applied questions. Um, but the ones they were struggling with were the more complex questions of integration. And so it kind of was, I was able to kind of address those differences and also kind of point out in my own teaching practice how I'm helping students make those integrations um, so that they can be more successful in the future. Right, I think that's a really good point. So it's much more effective to say, well, it's less effective to say, well, my students averaged an 85 on the final exam, so they're they're super smart. Mm -hmm. um, it's much more interesting to be able to say, my students did very well on uh, these types of questions, or they did very well on questions about these units that we covered in the class, and perhaps less well about something else, if there is some sort of story to be told to that end, you know, mm -hmm. if, if there is some angle that you can recognize in, in your analysis of student performance. Yeah, so we have a comment just about um, using student uh, discursive comments and uh, as evidence um, that, um, yeah, it's it was helpful and, um, when people only use positive comments from students, then the evaluators tend to kind of ignore that as evidence because uh, it shows that the person hasn't been balanced. And that, Christy, you've probably experienced that or have even heard other evaluators kind of talk about that. Right, well, it's important also to recognize that I believe that for promotion and tenure, um, the collective bargaining agreements uh, 
include something about if you're going to include any um, ISQ comments from a course, you have to include all of the ISQ comments from the course. And I think that's in the section about anonymous um, material. So that's something to be aware of too. And it also means that, yes, you you know, for a particular course, there might be 20 really wonderful comments. You rock, you're my favorite professor, keep doing what you're doing. And then there's one that is not positive and that voice may be in the minority, but again, I think it's important to be proactive and acknowledge that. Um, what, as a chair, I find more concerning, though, than one negative comment is, is if there are multiples of comments that strike the same theme. So if several students are saying the same thing, either within a particular section or across multiple sections for the same instructor, I really expect the instructor to have also notice that and to say something about it. And that often will keep me from saying something about it. Right. And if, if the uh, instructor faculty member would, would be able to say, uh, and here's how I've addressed exactly. those comments, exactly. and here's the outcome of how those things have been addressed, I think it could be quite uh, helpful. And it reassures the chair, the evaluator, that um, this is someone who takes their teaching seriously, that they're not ignoring things, that they're, they um, are able to respond. And that's a mark of excellence for someone to be reflective about their teaching in that way. Right. So there's a question here that says, do you agree for UNF's P&T process? Also for those with good ISQ and good feedback, do you suggest putting all student ISQ comments in an appendix of sorts? Um, again, I would, defer to the collective bargaining agreement, which um, uh, don't don't quote me, quote it. Um, yeah. But the, I believe it, it does say that if you're going to include any comments, you need to include all of the comments. Um, yeah, and you are required to, I think, include information about your ISQ ratings. But I think there's been a real move and a real push um, to include additional uh, pieces of evidence. And the, the goal, and, I, and that's why I really appreciate Krista's comments about you know, really thinking carefully about how you frame, how you select this kind of evidence. The tendency is for faculty to just dump everything into a, 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 either annual evaluation or promotion and tenure dossier. Um, and it's almost as if, um, you know, you kind of, ignore background noise, you know, and so I've, I've heard evaluators talk about um, just not looking at information because it's not, it's overwhelming. Uh, there's too much there. It's not structured. It's not organized. And so therefore they're going to ignore it. They're not even going to look at it because um, they're, they're wanting the faculty member to be able to tell the story about all of that evidence and not just simply say, well, here, you can see I'm excellent. You can see I'm wonderful. Um, uh, they want you to be able to tell that story and structure that explanation very carefully. And um, so it's not always good to just put everything in your dossier. It's not always good to just put everything in your annual evaluation. Um, so I'm, I, I, I agree with Krista, it's better to have select examples that illustrate how you teach and the outcomes um, of those teaching practices, uh, that's gonna be much more effective. And just another comment about the student comments, um, especially in terms of using um, emails from students, is that it's always better to um, um, hide or, or uh, redact the student's information from that communication. In our ISQs, those comments are provided anonymously so it's very easy to include all of those comments without um, revealing the name of the student. But when you start including letters and emails from students, uh, you um, either you want to remove the name of the student or um, and or get permission from the student to use that information in terms of your annual evaluation. Um, that can be quite helpful. Um, and it, it respects and honors the, uh, the sort of private uh, privateness of that communication in terms of an email or a letter or uh, comments or cards and things like that. It's always nice to get the students
permission to use those. Yeah, and I would say there's a categorical difference between using an email from a student um, in the example that we had earlier of a student who has spontaneously written to you after being in the workforce for a couple of years commenting on how well your courses helped prepare them for their experiences that using that kind of communication is very different than using an email exchange between a faculty member and a student in the course of a semester that's trying to help a student um, improve their performance on an assignment or um, do better in a course. Um, so certainly you'd want to redact those um, communications that are really part of your teaching process, whereas uh, something that's been provided to you um, after the fact, that's an evaluation of, of your teaching, I think is a little bit more open. But if you can get permission from the students, certainly you'd want to do so. Yeah, so these are really great questions. Um, so uh, keep uh, sending those in. And you know, maybe we'd like to hear some about your challenges. You know, What are some of the things that um, you've been challenged with as you've tried to pursue this. Um, you know, are there any things you'd like to share with the group um, or share with us, or uh, maybe even that brings a question uh, for you. Um, so, uh, Christopher, you as a chair, um, uh, you have about how many faculty in your department? Sixteen. Sixteen faculty, so a relatively large department. And um, when you do your annual evaluations, how many of those would you say um, provide evidence that's more quantitative versus more qualitative? And I imagine that in a, in a department of sociology, you have a lot of people who are trained in qualitative methods, but some who are also trained in quantitative methods. Right, so we have sociologists, anthropologists, and social workers, and, and it is interesting that the, um, the types of analysis and reflection that, that we see sometimes is reflective of the, the methods that people use in their research as well. But I think it's, it's important to keep in mind that, you know, as you were saying before, the, any, I think most of us as intellectuals, as academics, have very strong skill sets in converting data into a story, you know, and taking a very large amount of information and being able to glean what's useful or informative from that, that um, big mass of data. And that's really the skill that I think goes into a very good self-evaluation of one's teaching or a reflection on one's teaching. You know, it can't be just reflection and analysis, and it can't be just data. I mean, mm -hmm. that would be the equivalent of instead of turning in a research article, turning in a data set and saying, well, here, reviewer, you make sense of it clearly. I mean, you can find the message, right? Um, so, you know, I think it's important to, to recognize that, that we can all deploy some of those, those same skill sets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what about um, in terms of uh, direct evidence of student learning and, and indirect evidence of student learning? Do you tend to get more of one type? Do you see people using both types of evidence uh, in one uh, annual evaluation, or um, does it tend to be more one or the other? Um, I guess the split that, that I tend to see is the faculty who still are re uh, relying a little bit more on the ISQ. and actually working hard to interpret their ISQ results and, and thinking about the implications of those versus those who are using a plurality of kinds of indicators about their, their teaching success. Um, and, I, and I think it can be a little bit um, limiting just, just to think about the ISQ. I mean, certainly thinking deeply about that source of feedback is preferable to not doing so, um, but having being able to triangulate, right, and be able to look at multiple data sources that speak to one's teaching effectiveness, I think, helps you make a stronger case. Yeah. Um, well, uh, if, if there are uh, other questions, we uh, welcome those from you. We have uh, a little more time to be able to address those, but if we've been able to answer your questions, uh, then, uh, you know, we're happy to go ahead and, and uh, end the session. Uh, I do want to mention that, yes, again, that this will be um, recorded, the session is being recorded, and that there are, um, there is information on alternatives to assessing your teaching effectiveness 
on the um, OFE website. So I have that website listed here. And uh, this session will be on uh, the OFE YouTube channel. So you can kind of check those out as well. So it looks like we have some Yeah, well, there are a couple questions. of questions here. So one says, as a chair, would you sometimes wish there was more information in the annual evaluation reports or that there was less? Um, the answer is yes. <laughs> um, no, the, um, it really, uh, there's so much variation that, that it's true. Sometimes there is too much and sometimes there is too little. It is, I think as a chair, your job in evaluating people's teaching is made easiest when the faculty address enough that they do not leave you, that you're not left with questions um, and that they provide adequate evidence, but they, they don't sort of overwhelm and, and belabor. And I, I, it is important to know that a better um, self-evaluation and a better teaching portfolio is not a bigger self-evaluation or teaching portfolio. I think it's, you know, this is certainly something that faculty should talk about with their chair um, and get a sense of what is helpful to their chair, because I think that's something that is going to vary from one individual to another. So that would be really be my advice is to talk to your chair about what, what would be most helpful to him or her and what they have found most um, useful or informative. And I would maybe even go on to say is that, um, uh, you know, chairs have a differing uh, experience and, uh, you know, we have uh, several chairs that are relatively new uh, to, to the process. And so um, uh, there may be chairs who aren't sure what they want to see, right? So it's okay if um, if uh, if there isn't exactly a lot of clarity initially, but I think having the conversation really helps to mo move things forward in terms of that relationship between the faculty member and the chair, and to know that the, the faculty member is considering and pursuing and asking these questions about like how, how do I demonstrate to you about what I'm doing in the classroom and how, what kind of impact it's having. I think it's a, it's a positive conversation to have and it can be very helpful to, to, to support the annual evaluation process as well as those kind of mentoring relationships that happen um, in the department. So Absolutely. I encourage that. So we also have another question um, about uh, not being your best in the classroom, especially at, at you know at different times in our lives we're having to deal with with things, and that might influence our performance. And then how do we address that in terms of annual evaluation? Life happens. I mean, it does. And um, we would all, I think, as professionals, like to be our best selves 100% of the time, but but that's really an unreasonable standard. And I think it's it's fine to be to be human uh, with yourself. That's another instance where I think it's good to have a conversation um, with your department chair. Um, and I think the because the the life cycle of the self-evaluation document is a little bit different than than that of a, uh, a promotion and tenure dossier one might consider those kinds of disclosures a little bit differently um, and strategically. So for instance, I think it would be good to have a conversation with a department chair and or some folks um, from your department or from your, uh, the university who have served on the promotion and tenure committees. Um, if there is a, a personal issue or something that's kind of kept you from being your best in the classroom, um, whether whether strategically it would be good to be forthcoming about that in a promotion and tenure uh, uh, document, I think is, is something to get plenty of insight and, and advice about. Um, in terms of annual self-evaluation, because not that many people see that document, I think one can be a little bit more forthcoming there, or perhaps it's useful to have a, a side conversation with one's chair, perhaps before writing the self-evaluation to say, look, you and I know that this particular thing happened this year. 
how should I address that? Mm -hmm. um, or I see the implications of being distracted by this thing in my life, in my teaching. Um, what next? <laughs> right. Yeah, and I, I think um, if there are, let's say you're looking at ISQ data or any other kind of evidence and you see some kind of dip, some sort of, you know, change and shift, um, you know, the, an evaluator, people looking at a dossier or an annual evaluation portfolio will notice it. You know, it's, it's like it's one of those things that they they see and they want an explanation for. Humans are just kind of naturally curious about, well, why did that go down? Like, why was that? What was going, what on, was going on there? Yeah. And so it, it can be helpful to think through, you know, as that person who's being evaluated, how you would want that framed. And it doesn't mean that you have to go into a lot of detail, but um, sometimes kind of mentioning the context that, you know, maybe there's some sort of, you know, personal issue that you were dealing with and how that affected you in terms of uh, being able to uh, be present and uh, to be there for students uh, it could have been affected. And I think they would want, evaluators would want some kind of explanation um, more than they would want you to ignore that anything ever happened. Right. I think that's kind of the... Right. I mean, very much in line with, with you know, talking about negative comments from students and so on. Um, those things will be there, and, and so they do need some kind of attention. But but to um, think, to get to know your, your audience as you think about um, what kind or how much attention to mm -hmm. provide to those. Yeah. Well, um, thank you all for your questions. I think this will uh, wrap up our session. Of, I really appreciated your questions. They're very insightful. I think it brought about a good conversation. Um, again, uh, this uh, session will be uh, posted online, and for all of those who registered and participated, uh, we will send you uh, a link to that video and uh, a link to any of the materials. If you have additional questions that we weren't able to address as part of this session, please feel free to um, email me, and I'll be able to uh, field those questions and get you some more information uh, if needed. And then again, um, as you're thinking about your annual evaluations or if you're uh, thinking about going out for promotion and tenure and you'd like some more ideas, um, uh, I do encourage you to check out our website. Uh, we have even some uh, measures that you can use, some questions you can ask students um, that might be helpful. Um, and again, the Office of Faculty Enhancement is here to help you um, think through some of those processes uh, on your own to deal with your specific course and you know, ask those questions or deal with that evidence that you want to provide um, in your uh, promotion, tenure dossier, annual evaluation, or even for your own reflection and continuous improvement. Krista, thank you for being here. Well, thanks I for really inviting appreciate me. Appreciate your insights. I enjoyed it. Um, thanks uh, all of you for attending. And, and thanks uh, very much for participating, everyone.